I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. Last time, the Van Allen belts were on fire and destroying the whole planet. This time, they still are. The world's top scientists have come up with a brilliant strategy to deal with it, sit on our thumbs and wait to see if it eventually burns out. Admiral Harriman Nelson, one of the smartest scientists in the world, has designed and built the Sea View, the world's most advanced nuclear submarine, and he has a better plan. Use one of the nuclear missiles on his sub to put the fire out, and he's not going to let anyone stop him from doing it, whether it's other scientists or his own crew. It would help you treat the crew as men and not like children. You just let them in on your plans. That has always been my intention, Captain, but only at the proper time. And when is that, Admiral? And how did you decide? What's the advantage of keeping them in the dark until some arbitrary point in time that you think is proper? That statement has rarely made sense to me in any context. It really doesn't fit here. The men need to know what they're fighting, how they're fighting it, and most important, what they're fighting for. The appropriate time to fill them in on all that is before the fight starts, not during it. Meanwhile, Sparks says the static is getting worse. He can't pick up anything or contact anybody. The Admiral has an idea about that. Just exactly where are we? We're right here, sir. Good. Set a course close in toward Cape de San Roque. You may I ask why, sir? Static caused by magnetic storms may knock out radio, but it won't affect the telephone cable. In the days before satellite communications, there were major phone cables crossing the oceans at various points. At the time this was made, the first communication satellite, Telstar 1, was in orbit and functioning, but presumably all the static is making it unusable too. His plan is to find one of the phone cables and tap into it to make a phone call to Washington. It won't be said out loud, but he's having the captain move close into shore where the water is shallower so he can deploy divers to hook into the cable. Four divers will go out, the captain, Alvarez, and two crewmen. To make sure we know who the stars are, the captain is in a bright yellow wetsuit and Alvarez is in a red one. The other two are in basic black because it doesn't matter who they are. Speaking as a diver, these underwater sequences are outstanding. The equipment is appropriate to the time, what a surprise, and the way the light behaves under the water is as authentic as it gets. Notice that the captain's suit is almost white now, and Alvarez's suit appears to be purple. The water filters out various wavelengths of light, and the deeper you go, the more colors of light are filtered out. Red is the first to go, which is why Alvarez's suit is changing color. It only appears red when he's swimming past the artificial lights. In the ambient light of the water, most of the red in his suit has been filtered out, and the blue of the water, as well as other pigments in the suit, color it to make it look purple. I can't tell you how much this kind of authenticity excites me. I should probably seek help, but not right now. So far, I haven't been able to find out where these were filmed, but I really want to go there and dive. For reasons that are never explained, the other three take off and leave the captain in the dust at the moment he's on his own, and he's found the cable. He waves his light to signal the sea view. Again, I have to go over to IMDB in their goofs section because there's an extended comment about the way they use these lights and the various brightnesses they have at different points. I won't go into boring detail, but it's another case of someone who doesn't understand how light behaves underwater. 
what we're seeing here is as authentic as they could get it, and the goof writer is mistaken. Sawfish can get huge. They're some of the biggest fish down there and can reach a length of 25 feet. Even so, shooting it was unnecessary. They're not aggressive toward humans. They have no idea what we are, so they leave us alone. The chances of that thing attacking him were slim and none, as the saying goes, but it looks intimidating, so we have to harm it. Did they shoot a real fish there? I haven't been able to find out, but it wouldn't be unusual for the time. Each man in the party is carrying a spear gun, and soon enough, Captain Crane is going to wish his was still loaded. That would be why. Sightings of giant squid go back as far as the 4th century BCE, but until recently we knew precious little about them. They're probably the basis of the Kraken legends. We had found pieces of them, but getting hold of a live one to study proved to be a challenge like no other. It wasn't until 2004 that we got some actual images of one in its natural habitat. Thing is, its natural habitat isn't on the bottom like this one is doing. They're benthic, which means they swim around in the water column like your average fish. Our friend here is fairly authentic in terms of its size, how it's put together, and how the tentacles work. So I can forgive the error of making it a bottom dweller. Well, mostly I can forgive it. Alvarez to the rescue, even though as far as I could see, that spear missed. The other two will join them, fire their spears, and eventually get the captain free. And not one of those guys aimed at the most obvious target. In a situation like this, you want to attack the most sensitive, vulnerable points. That enormous eye is sitting right there looking at them, and it won't occur to any of them to shoot at it. You do that, your squid lets go at once, because that's going to mess him up big time. Go for the eyes, boo! Maybe Irwin thought that would be too graphic for some audiences. Whatever the case, they get this thing off the captain, and the phone tap is in place. Make your call, Admiral. This is London. Hello? This is London speaking. Can you hear me, London? This is Submarine Sea View, Admiral Nelson. Why oh, hear you, Sea View? Go ahead. Could you patch me through to Washington? Hello, hello, come in, London. Oh, sorry, sir, not a chance. We've been out of contact with the States for 35 hours. Never mind, that whole thing was pointless. The man on the other end does report that everything is flooded out and London has been evacuated. That's as much as they can get before the line goes dead again. That means if they can't get hold of the president, the final decision lies with the admiral. We already know what it is. There are only two choices. So with higher directives unavailable and by the authority vested in me, I have made that final decision. We are headed for the Marianas to fire the missile. The men aren't crazy about that idea, but as he said, what's the alternative? Sit around and do nothing and hope it all works out? That's the Alvarez approach. The Admiral figures, and I have to agree, that doing something is better than doing nothing. He says, new work schedules are being posted and they're going to be rough on everybody. But we can do this. Our world faces its darkest hour. But I am convinced that, with God's help, my plan will succeed. And the world will survive. That is all. <laughs> It strikes me as funny that the Navy didn't ban smoking on submarines until 2010. And then the reason was to protect the rest of the crew from secondhand smoke, not to try and make anybody quit. 
I would think smoking in an enclosed tin can like a sub would be a bad idea because there's only so much oxygen available and burning stuff uses it up. But there's probably something I don't know that explains that. Lieutenant. What seems to be your problem, Mr. Hodges? Just don't feel good, sir. I'll be okay in an hour or so. You try and get some rest. We'll manage. More and more men are ending up in sick bay from exhaustion, overwork, and nerves. Dr. Hiller is more than a little concerned. Therefore, with eyes to see and minds that question, oh, they know the world's probably on the brink of oblivion, but instead of trying to get to their homes and finding their families, here they are, racing under the sea driven on by one man's wild scheme, which has no proven scientific basis. Doctor, this is a submarine, not a nursery school. And the Admiral's orders must be obeyed. I wonder. She wonders. I wonder what she means by that. She and Alvarez are both wild cards. They're not part of the crew and aren't under the Admiral's authority. Might want to keep an eye on both of them. I had time to think about it out there on the ice. First, I was puzzled. But then I began to see things clearly. As a child, I was pledged to the church. But my mind was filled with doubts, enough to make me turn my back on my chosen path. But out there, the fire burned away my doubts, and I saw the truth. Case in point, he was severely dehydrated and lay out there in 130 degree heat for two days. He was most likely hallucinating, but he thinks it was a serious religious experience and it affects what he thinks and what he does. I repeat, keep an eye on him. Professionally, I'm interested to know if the Admiral always behaves this way, this ruthless compulsion that... Doc, excuse me. That's what we're studying in this film, Doctor. We have the funding available, so you're welcome to join the project. Where are we, Romano? Sub's right here, Skipper. The owner is Right where? I can't see your finger. The engine room reports that the generator is broken. It's an armature, Captain. How long to fix? About 10 hours. Can't afford to wait 10 hours? It's dangerous not to wait. Radar and sonar are both knocked out. We can't move without it. Yes, we can. There's nothing wrong with the motors. That's for sonar and radar. These are safe waters. Keep moving and rush those repairs. In other words, let's fly blind. Doesn't matter. Perhaps our death comes even sooner than the others. <gasps> what? Lee! Mines! Mines! Get ahead! After the mines! All stop! All stop! Take over. Where are they? Who put those there and why? It doesn't matter because even when the captain yells all stop and the operators comply, it's going to take quite some distance to bring the boat to a complete stop. Caught in the searchlight casing, sir. They can't shake that thing loose. If they back up, it slides down and explodes on the boat. If they go forward, it slides down and explodes on the boat. This is going to require the mini sub and a torch to cut that line that's attached to the mine. Seaman Smith, you're up. CPO Gleason, the guy who was chewing Smith out for being polite to an admiral, will go with him. That's going to weigh heavily on a lot of people's consciences, though whether the Admiral's conscience is one of them is open to question. What are your orders now, sir? Back out of the minefield, dead slow. Then proceed with caution until the generator is fixed. Proceed how? They're still flying blind. That's how they wound up in that minefield. He's being impossible, and the men are getting more and more fed up with it. What's that? Nothing important. Seems that uh, somebody's concerned about my health and welfare. That's nice. Now what does it really say? They'll have to wait a moment. He's needed in sick bay. Hodges? He smashed in the medicine chest and swallowed these, Admiral. Must have typed that note on my machine. 
I was to blame for the death of Gleason and Smith. I sabotaged the generator. Although only God knows why I did this terrible thing. I know why. To stop the Admiral from carrying out his plan. He didn't count on the Admiral's determination. All right, Captain. You blame me for the death of Leeson and Smith. But here is positive proof that those men were victims not of my impatience, but of deliberate sabotage. Any comments? Yes, sir. Sabotage might be just the beginning. You're driving my crew to the point of exhaustion possibly even rebellion. He says, if you don't let up and give them a chance to breathe, you'll never make your goal. And by the way, that lame little attempt at self-justification is just that, lame. You had a workable alternative, wait until the generator was fixed. You chose to go forward under dangerous conditions. If Connors hadn't spotted those mines from the observation dome, you'd all be dead right now and your plans and figures might as well be toilet paper. But the word rebellion got his attention. I found this note in my cabin just a few minutes ago. If you continue your lunatic project, you'll never live to see it completed. He said someone was concerned about his health and welfare. Seems like the concern is they want to put an end to both. Hodges will never see it completed. He won't bother you anymore. I'm not so sure that he did. These notes were not typed on the same machine. Double the security guard. All men off duty restricted to quarters. Until proved otherwise, everyone is suspect. As far as Dr. Hiller is concerned, that includes the Admiral himself. She has serious concerns about him. Take this note sent to the Admiral. Run a test sample on all the typewriters. Well, I don't have to. The dots off the small artist was typed on my machine. In the Admiral's office, Kathy. Yes. Especially considering that. She's afraid the Admiral is losing him. Captain, may I speak freely? Please do. You're so concerned about your crew that you're overlooking other danger signs. Admiral Nelson's becoming a, a textbook case, taciturnity combined with anxiety, high irritability, and now perhaps delusions of persecution. Yeah, that's what I just said, sort of. At least the generator is fixed, so we get to hear that annoying sonar ping any time we see the boat in the water. By 1961, submarines didn't do that. For the most part, they towed a passive sonar array behind them. This was a collection of super-sensitive microphones that picked up any and all noise that was going on down there. A good one could even check the reflected sound of their own engines and tell you if there was an obstacle ahead. They almost never used active sonar. If you've seen the hunt for Red October, you saw the captain communicating with the Americans using the active sonar. That's about how often the average sub actually used it. Why? Because the ping noise might tell you what's out there, but it also tells your enemies that you are out there, and it does a good job of telling them where you are. Guess what? You don't want that. My theory is we kept it pinging in this movie because that was what the average viewer expected to hear when they saw a sub underwater. So in a way, it's just fan service. They get the fire put out and everyone gets topside to get out of the smoke. Ship off the port side, sir. <laughs> Looks for calm. Be calmed is what happens to sailboats, Admiral. You should know that. That ship is adrift. But its foghorn is still sounding, so there may be someone alive on board. Break out the rescue teams again.
So the foghorn must be on some kind of automatic timer. But seeing a ghost ship is enough for the men. Sir, the men feel if it's really the end coming, they ought to be spending their last hours with their wives and families. Now we respectfully demand, sir, that you take us back home. Respectfully demand. I have got to find a use for that phrase someday. I see. Well, may I remind all of you that this is a government ship. Demands made by a crewman or an officer could be considered mutiny. That brought them up short. Alvarez tries to chime in and agree that the men should be with their families. I assume that dog is his family, so he's not a concern. Listen, Mr. Alvarez. Just a minute, Captain. Mr. Alvarez makes a valid point. I do not believe the world is ending. If I did, I'd be heading for home myself. But in fairness to everyone, there is some recent news that may have a bearing on your decision. One of the men found a recent newspaper from Hawaii on the ship. The Admiral has been reading it. The headline reads, World subs ordered to stop Seaview from firing missile. So in addition to all our other problems, we are now a hunted ship. Every other sub in the ocean is going to be hunting for them with orders to stop them using any means necessary, such as torpedoes. He says, that doesn't change my plan. We're heading for the target area and we'll find a way to get there. But in view of this news and uh, your request, the men who want to go home may do so on that yacht. I think you're fools to try it. But I'll supply sufficient water and food to give you a good fighting chance. Captain Crane is about to burst. The Admiral is encouraging desertion. I'd rather have a small, loyal crew than risk where this habitat. That's enough, Captain. Men, you have 15 minutes to make your decision. Please have any in the sick bay that want to go placed aboard the yacht. He makes a fair point. There's a good chance at least one of those guys will kill him if he deems it necessary. The Admiral says we're better off without a murderer on board. Whoever is out to get him is getting serious as evidenced by the fire. At least that's his theory. The captain has a different one. Begging your pardon, sir. Romano? Fire detail found a cigar burning on the floor, sir. Meaning I was smoking in bed? Apparently, sir. Apparently, sir, except I ran out of cigars before I went to bed. Lieutenant, file the captain's report. Then I have my cabin cleaned up. I'm going to check supplies for more cigars. So whoever did set the fire left the cigar there to make it look like an accident. Who set it? We don't get to find out. Will those men make it home in that ship? We don't get to find that out either. Nobody's quite sure what to do. Dr. Hiller is convinced that the Admiral is falling apart, but as far as anybody can see, he's still in control of his faculties, so there's nothing she can do. Procedure under which a subordinate officer may relieve a superior of his command. That's just in case. Of what? I decide the Admiral is irresponsible. Now I'm even more confused because I thought, in spite of everything, Crane believed in this plan. Now he says if the Admiral is crazy, then so is his plan. So if it's necessary, I'll relieve him of command and we won't fire the missile. That triggers a big fight and she storms out. On top of everything else, they're tracking the temperature on the surface. The Admiral says if the global temperature reaches 175 degrees, that's it, everything is done. How he arrived at that, I don't know, but that's why he has to fire the missile at such a precise time. He has to deliver it before the temperature reaches that threshold, because if he doesn't, there won't be anything left to save. And even if he succeeds after the time limit, we have two women and one dog on board. Repopulating the planet is going to take some doing. They've reached their destination. They're 12 miles from the launch point. The Admiral is out of aspirin, so he and Connors will head to sick bay to see about some more. Lucius is there getting treated for a minor shark bite. Whatever he said that made Bessie angry, I suggest he not say it again. Lieutenant, you should be on duty. Not me, sir. I'm beat. Aren't we all? Get forward. Sorry, sir. As a sick man, I take my orders from the doctor. Sick, huh? In my judgment, you're faking. With due respect, sir, I think your judgment's been a little rocky lately. Why, you gold-bricking pipsqueak! 
That right there is grounds to relieve him because striking a man under your command is a major offense. It almost got General Patton drummed out of the army in the middle of World War II when he did it. And at least he hit the guy hard. This was almost a love tap. Maybe the Admiral's muscles are getting a little flabby from being a desk jockey for so long. In any case, Crane has called for security, and Dr. Hiller is prepared to certify that the Admiral is irresponsible. Sir, I deeply regret this, but under federal regulations number 249, governing conduct in the high seas, I am forced to relieve you of your command. Arrest? Not arrest, sir. I'm placing you on sick list. And if I refuse? I'm afraid you have no choice. He also says he's decided not to fire the missile. That's too much for the Admiral, but before he gets a chance to say much, they're interrupted. Captain, this is Sonar. Unidentified fast propellers bearing 090, about 2,000 yards astern. They've found us. Torpedo approaching to starboard! We have no idea who's in that sub or what country they represent. But we know what those torpedoes represent, so better avoid them. Crane's maneuvers will help them avoid three salvos, but the other sub is closing fast and will soon have a better shot at them. There's only one thing to do. Please scream and run around in circles! Ah! Thanks for coming! I probably shouldn't have shown that because Alvarez just might try it. Dive! 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 400 feet! 400! The idea is to go deep enough that the other sub can't follow. The sea view can take an incredible amount of pressure, but that other sub can't. At a certain depth, it'll have to break off the chase. Or not. That wasn't exactly what anybody had in mind when they said break off the chase. Let's talk about irresponsible commanders sometime. Right now, there's another obstacle. I suppose somewhere in the vast reaches of Earth's oceans there is a type of octopus that gets that big, but we haven't found it. As far as we know, the world's largest species of octopus lives about 12 miles from me in Puget Sound. I've seen some that were as big as I am, and while they can look scary, the truth is they're gentle giants. They don't have any beef with humans. Every so often one might put a tentacle out to try and figure out what some piece of your gear is. My wife had one grab her camera one day. But as soon as it knows the object isn't good to eat, it lets go. This guy is no different. He's looking for food. Octos are not aggressive. In fact, they're quite shy. Besides everything else those suckers do, each one is also a taste bud. Octos use their tentacles and suckers to test the world around them and determine what's good to eat and what isn't. Metal isn't good to eat, and this guy would know that within three seconds of grabbing the sub. That means it has no good reason to hold on or try to do any damage. A real octopus would have let go by now. And by the way, unlike the giant squid, octopuses do live on the bottom, not up in the water column where this guy is. So we got those two critters precisely backwards. They'll send electric charges through the hull to make that thing let go, and once again, I direct you to good old IMDB in their goofs page. Check it out and you'll find an excellent explanation as to why that wouldn't work. I do appreciate it when someone else does my work for me. Oh, what happened? Power room. Power room. Power room, power room. No answer. Negative. Control room. What happened to the reactors? Don't know, sir. They just quit. I'll find out myself. Nuclear reactors don't just quit on their own. They have to have help. This one is no exception. The Admiral scheme is suicidal insanity. If you pick up a fatal dose of radiation, it glows red. 
Dr. Hiller sacrificed her own life to shut the reactor off. The big question is why. Doctor, what were you doing in there? Making sure you don't reach your target position by four o'clock. So you were the saboteur. Well, she won't have to die slowly and painfully from radiation poisoning, though I'm not sure becoming shark poop is much better. Control room, switch to auxiliary fast. Aye, aye, sir. Moving on battery, sir. Very well. What's the temperature reading? 173.2, and the fire's still burning. I knew it. Zuko was wrong. There was no burnout point. Zuko was the dude with the Guy Fox beard who was pounding the table to prove that he's more rational than the Admiral is. He said the fire would burn itself out at 173. It didn't. So the missile is the only alternative. Stand by the fire. Aye, aye, sir. Sail camera, prepare to track missile. Sail camera on. Missile room, stand by. Number 8-2. Missile room standing by. Target position, 10 minutes. This is the missile room. Hatch opening now. We made it, Alvarez. We'll fire that missile on time. I think not, Admiral. You knew he was going to be trouble. That's one of the bombs that Captain Crane was showing Dr. Hiller. He's fully prepared to set it off if necessary. Oh, man, has a right to challenge God's will. Have you gone completely mad? Put down that bomb. Man has sown the seeds of sin. Now he will reap the whirlwind. I have a question for Alvarez. If it's all preordained and everybody is destined to die when God says so, why did you rescue Captain Crane from the squid? Wasn't it God's will that he become fish food? He's not listening. He's off into a serious religious frenzy. He's thoroughly enjoying it, and nobody is going to deprive him of it. Attention, everyone. This is Alvarez. I have a bomb. A bomb. If anybody tries to fire the missile, I'll blow up the ship. Captain Crane, wherever you are, see that no one interferes. He's not in the position to do much of anything right now, Alvarez. Connors and Lucius find him and bring him around. He says, we have to find a way to fire that missile. He thinks he knows one. Remember these things? There's something new. This is a magnetic primer. In case we lose power in the control room, we just... Slap this dude on by hand and away she goes. He's heading outside with one to put it on the missile. The Admiral is watching his progress on the exterior camera. We can't tell if Alvarez just isn't looking at the monitor in the control room or if it's out of his line of sight. Either way, he's blissfully unaware of what's going on. Nevertheless, the Admiral will keep him busy so he doesn't look around too much. Alvarez, are you saying that man must accept destruction even though it's in his power to avert it? It's not for us to judge, Admiral. Freeze! Up to judge, maybe, but we can reason. If God ordains that man should die without a fight, then why does he give us the will to live? He doesn't have an answer for that one. Maybe he needs to go back out onto that ice and cook a little more to find it. Your time's run out, Admiral. Oh, has it now? Captain Crane is all right, though the launch shook him up a bit. Yes, it worked. The fire is out and the sky is returning to normal. Whatever that may be. Lee. Full speed for home, Lee. Aye, aye, sir. Full speed for home, assuming there's anything left. They're acting as though now that the fire is out, everything on the planet is back to normal. But we heard all the stories of whole cities destroyed, evacuated, flooded out, 
forest fires, the entire food belt in the middle of the United States has been reduced to nothing but ashes. We heard all these things through the course of the movie. They said themselves that maybe the reason they couldn't contact Washington was because Washington wasn't there anymore. It just leaves us hanging like that. But as I said, this movie is a character study. We watched the Admiral go through several phases over the course of the story, and in the end, he returns to his stoic self, basically says, well, that happened, now let's go home. We learn that when he believes he's right, he's almost arrogant about it and won't let anybody or anything stand in his way, sometimes even to the point of being cruel, such as not letting Crane look for more survivors of Alvarez's group. In the end, he practically stands alone and he's vindicated. It was a fascinating study of a very complex character and it was well done, science goofs and all. It was reasonably successful and as we know, it spawned a TV series of the same name that people are still watching and enjoy right now. We'll be heading there next, but this film has given us a good look at the sea view, her capabilities and her commanders. Even though they'll be played by different actors, their working relationship and friendship will carry over unchanged. So come on along, let's check out Irwin Allen's most successful show together. We'll try to figure out what makes it tick, why it was so popular, and probably even make fun of it along the way. Thanks for watching. I hope I'll see you there. I'm breathing underwater. I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. But all I gotta do is breathe underwater. Admiral Harriman Nelson, one of the sm the idea for these underwater sequence. Ah, good grief! Don't then we write the sequences. He was severely high. Blah, blah, blah. Zuko is the... I have to go over to... I, okay, man, I am screwing this all up.